Oh, hello. You just caught me um, out in the garden. Doing, I'm doing some gardening. That's the sound of some gardening if you're listening uh, to the audio podcast. Uh, welcome to another Rich Lang's Let's Square Theatre podcast. Um, this week's guest is Sophie Willen, who I think you're going to enjoy. So just watch it and see. Uh, I am still on tour. I'll quickly tell you what dates are coming up if you're watching this at the time. I'm Barry St. Edmunds on the 9th of May. Um... Uh, oh yeah, I'm Liverpool on the 10th of May doing two gigs as a due to popular demand. A late gig has been added, um, so there should still be tickets for that. Uh, and um, then there's all sorts coming up, I guess. You know, who knows? Who knows where I go after that? Maybe you know some people. Oh, Chippenham on the 12th of May. If you didn't manage to catch me in Corsham, two miles away, Birmingham on the 13th of May. And uh, remember, Rich Change Less Square Thread podcast will be coming back in. September and October and November. If you want to catch one of those live, it's always better live, go to lessersquaretheatre.com and you can buy tickets already. They're already selling and no guests will be announced for a while, but uh, uh, there's some very exciting possibilities as always. Uh, go to richchang.com slash gigs if you want to find out if I'm coming near you on the tour. This it goes on till June the 6th. Um, and uh, then I'm taking the summer off. Uh, so, uh, you know will be quiet for a little bit but there's still quite a few of these podcasts to come and there's a couple of specials uh, I've recorded uh, one at the Macanfrath Festival and there's ones coming up at the Wells Comedy Festival uh, which will follow on from the end of this series and still some great podcasts to come I've done the ones that I've done and they're great so let's sit back relax and enjoy Rich Hangs that's a square theatre podcast <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who is about to perform to a room full of orphans. It's Richard Herring. <laughs> that is called improvisation, my friend, my fan friends. Um, and all the people at home are going, what's going on? I don't understand. That's what's happening. That's how they're speaking. So uh, welcome to the show. That's what they have. What's going on, Rich? That's what my audience are like. Welcome to Rich Harry's Leicester Square Theatre Podcast. I was hanging around with B Asterisk Witched the other day. Uh, you know, Adele, Keevy, Lindsay and Sinead. Sean from, Shane from The Boys Zone was trying to get in, but we said, you're not allowed in here, mate. This is just for cool people. And that's the bro- he's the brother of the twins. Come on, get with it. Uh, they call it Rahalastapar. That's how they call it Rahalastapar. Got very, they're Scottish, I don't know if you know that. So, um, uh, we'll crack straight on, or, or nearly straight away. I was just, the, the, the nicest thing that's happened to me this week, um, it's sort of a weird thing, the, the, I saw the most joyful performance of ending I've seen, is my, my daughter started to, uh, uh, like, to have music played after the bath at night time. So she got out of the bath, and then was in her bedroom, and naked, and All You Need Is Love came on, and she did a sort of interpretive dance. <laughs> All you need is love. Which is kind of weird, you know, a grown man watching a three-year-old. <laughs> she, she did, like, a little uh, breakdance section in the middle. I've never seen a naked breakdance before, but it's something amazing. Uh, but I particularly liked it because when I tried to join in with the All You Need Is Love chorus and sung along, she went, No, Daddy, shut up! Which I don't think was really in the spirit. <laughs> of the piece uh, so look we're going to um, it's just turned into me talking about my daughter that's what it's going to be for the rest for the next 15 years and then you know there'll be the awful teenage years imagine if the podcast is still going on then oh my god I, I just hope I die that's I just I hope I die <laughs> so we can get out of this so anyway our guest this week is probably weirdly enough probably best known for doing a dance herself in front of Ryland from the X Factor on the TV show Up Late with Rylan. That's why we're here to see. Will you please welcome Sophie Willen, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much. Come in, sit down. There's a microphone under your bottom, you have to pick it up. There we go. Hello, there we go. How are you doing? I'm all right, how are you? I'm very good, you're very glamorous. Am I? Yeah, I just look at this. put loads of makeup on in the dressing room. <laughs> uh, that was just to compensate for the wine I, I drank before the the makeup. 
Yeah. <laughs> was that today or yesterday? I'm, I'm still... Probably both. I'm still recovering yeah, from that's... Friday night. Uh, so, uh, this, when, as you get older, it gets, that drinking gets worse. I had two <laughs> drinks when I did a pub quiz, and uh, look at me now. Uh, that was beautiful once. Uh, but, um, yeah, I saw you do this... Uh, I didn't know what it was called from the YouTube clip, but I've managed to locate the show, Up yeah. Late with Ryland. Yeah. You've done quite a few episodes of Up Late that with was Ryland. My f- yeah, fine hour, that. Yeah. Up Late with Ryland. Shall I show you the moves? Yeah, I'd love to see yeah. them, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. I've got a fan. <laughs> lovely. Did you see it? Up Late with Ryland. I'll show you the moves. Thank you very much. What's your name? Kirsten, this is just for you. Lovely. <laughs> um, the first move is... Th- but this is lovely, isn't it? You come on a nice podcast and before you know it, you're tit-shaking at a crowd. It's lovely. Um, so basically, the tit-shake is the first move. And the key with the tit-shake, Richard, yes. do you want to try it? I, I think yeah, I probably on. can do it. Yeah. The thing is, you know, what you've got to do is just suddenly imagine you've suddenly grown breasts. Yes. Well, you don't have to imagine that much. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> Imagine you've suddenly grown up, so you're terrified and you're desperately trying to shake them off your body. Yeah. Right, so you go... Ah, get it off! <laughs> in the yeah. breasts, Richard, that's it. Yeah, that's... Yeah, it's going down to my stomach It's going in reason. your hips. It's getting very gutty with you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's still nice, yeah, it's though. That's good, thank you. The second one is um, the wiggle, right? Now, the thing with the wiggle um, is you've just got to imagine, because people say they get very frightened, they go in too fast. Don't. Okay. Actually, because I know you're tempted, I can see it in your eyes. But it's dangerous, because my grandma had a partial prolapse from this, so you've got to be very careful. What you've got to do is just imagine your hips are trapped in a box, Richard, yeah. right? And just hit every corner of the box, right? That's absolutely perfect, Richard. You're very, very sensual. What a sensual man. It's all coming out now, isn't it? I remember. Right? Now what you've got to do... Try imagine... doing this to Enya, that's my problem. Yeah. <laughs> You can take this home for your wife tonight, (laughs) right? Now, what you've got to do, Richard, is imagine... Now, when you've got every corner of the box, you want to make a circle. What do you do, Richard? Polyfill her in, polyfill her in, polyfill her in. That's perfect. Very sexy. Last one, the twerk. I didn't think this is how the evening would go. (laughs) Did you? This last one is the twerk. Now, everybody thinks with the twerk it's in the arse. It's actually not. It's in the balls of your feet, Kirsten. Right? It is. What you've got to do, Richard, yep. keep your feet... Gl- the balls of your feet got to stay glued to the floor. Okay. No matter how much you want this moment to end, which we all do, right? <laughs> you can't get away. Yeah. So you try and run away, but your balls of your feet stay... Gl- no, what is this? <laughs> just... It's not the okie-koke, just come on. So you've got to try and run away, but just imagine, Richard, as it's happening, you're being electrically charged through the vagina, okay. right? I can imagine that. So it's going through the vagina, Richard, through the vagina, and then you're trying to run away. Ah! Yeah, you, you, you're better than me. There you go. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Oh, quite tired now. Oh. He was, very good. Who do you enjoy? Ryland didn't join in when, he, when you did no, it No, he him. didn't. You did. I did. Yes. Yeah. I saw a weak prey. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, just in case there's people at home who are not You look knackered, do you want to I am, I'm very tired. God, you don't know how difficult it is. I love the way you say this is something to take home to your wife. I've got two children, I haven't had sex for ten years, so it's a... Uh... <laughs> and I've got two children and they're both, the oldest one's three, so that's... <laughs> the worrying thing. Um, feels like 10 years no, it's, again it's a lie darling it's a lie we, we make love all the time so, and, it, and I'm amazed <laughs> too much information cut that out uh, so um, <laughs> you've got your new moves now I do so yes so it's will... going to be fine I'm going yeah. to wake her up she's going to be delighted I'm going to wake her up yeah. when I get home tonight <laughs> she's going oh thank you darling uh, thank you for waking me up we're very tired we're both very tired um, you've been you, you've, you're pretty new to stand-up comedy but you've been mm-hmm. doing quite a lot of theatre stuff before you got into stand-up comedy yeah it was right? kind of funny but by accident um, it wasn't yeah a choice for it to yeah. sort of theatre live art cabaret and then it went accidentally into sort of stand-up comedy. Really. How, how did that accident occur? Well, I started dressing up as a cat for a really long period of time and it just it wasn't, it wasn't very serious. Right. But it was meant to be. <laughs> I don't know what happened. And then uh, I set up a cabaret collective for a few years. Yeah. 
then we did sort of arts council funded projects and different things and then eventually I got in touch with the BBC producer. I mean, I stood outside the Media City building and flyered every producer. <laughs> right. Until one of them agreed to come to my show. I felt, I think they thought it was sort of a hostage. So uh, they came to the show and then one of them said, why don't you try stand up? So okay. that's how it happened really. So, you're yeah, from, so it's quite new. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so 20, 2014 was that the yeah. first show? Yeah. Well, that, no, that was the first, that was a theatre solo right. show. And then my first stand up show was 2016. Right, okay. And so you've, yeah. been, you've been winning, you won uh, best, well, you got nominated for best newcomer in Edinburgh. Chortle, that was the well, best Chortle. newcomer, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you've won this, uh, the first recipient of this Carolina Hearn bursary. bursary yeah, so and then the Edinburgh Comedy Award last year, but yeah. it was different, the show. Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah, that's right. So it's showing off now. Yeah, but it's all that's happening very fast. Yeah. It's, which is great. It has happened yeah, fast. Yeah. yeah, but then also a long time because the theatre and the solo shows I was doing for ages and the writing, it was all kind of tapped into this. Sure. Just slightly different. Yeah. Sure. Um, and so you're from Bolton. Mm hmm. Um, picked that, I just picked it up. I'm like Henry Higgins. And uh, <laughs> I've, I've read that you first got into drama when you were on holiday in Ibiza with your gran. Is that right? And that you went to the hotel comedy club? Yes. Oh, that theatre club? Yeah, my grandma. Uh, I went to live with my grandma when I was about eight years old. And uh, she'd uh, just got divorced at this point, so she was having quite a renaissance. Right. Um, and she just discovered nightclubs, feminism, and zebra print, so she was having <laughs> a fucking while. <laughs> but I mean feminism in a very, you know, 90s way. Like, she joined Anne Summers and said cock a lot, so it's very... <laughs> anyway, we went to Ibiza, because she wanted to see Enigma perform live in the Café Del Mar. Enigma, are they, what's it, remind me who Enigma were. We don't need another dance demonstration, <laughs> but they did like sort of dance music, you know, right, it's okay. very do, do, and they had sort of weird primal sex noises just sort of thrown in. Okay. You're nodding quite intensely, did you? Yeah. Were you there? You remember it? Yeah, it's, it was quite, it's quite, so we, you know, do, 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 ow, you know, it's very sudden and it really gets, you've got to be quite careful when you dance to it. Yeah. Because Grandma had a partial prolapse, like I say, through that. So you've got to be... So anyway, we went to see them in Ibiza. Yeah. Uh, and then I joined the Hotel Drama Club. And I got my first role as the Crying Clown. Okay. And I performed about... I think it was sort of four pissed, sunburnt couples. <laughs> but it felt like an arena. It did. <laughs> and then I just had the bug after that. So I started performing and writing. And I loved it. You it know. seems like, you know, a hotel in Ibiza having a theatre club seems like quite surprising. I've never been to a hotel with a I think it's just club. a drama. They just gave yeah. you a wig and told you to go yeah. on. You know, it's just... But it felt, you know, like the Royal Theatre. You know, yeah. it's fabulous. <laughs> yeah. It's once you're bitten by the bag. You, you have... You know, like our last week's guest, you've got quite a... You know, quite a confessional style to your comedy. And you talk a lot about your family as well. And your family is quite a... Uh, Quite an unusual upbringing, I guess, for, in lots of ways. I suppose so, yeah. yeah. So you were, your mum's was, is a, a, a drug addict? So yes, a unfortunately. Addict. Yeah. yeah, but we are relieved she picked drugs because she was a terrible mother, so it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is a relief. Honestly, she's not very good at it, Richard. What's right. your mum like? Well, she's probably uh, not ever had heroin. No. Barbara Heron, I'm guessing. That's a start, isn't it? Yeah. It's... <laughs> I don't think she's ever taken a drug of any kind. No. Uh, she's a very uh, different yeah. lady, I would say. Yeah, my mum's fabulous. She just wasn't good at the mum stuff. Yeah. Like, she once tried to cook me breakfast, and it was an absolute disaster. Uh, she tried to boil me an egg, actually. It was a very simple task. It was the most stressful experience of our life. She just stood stirring at the pan for 20 minutes, just going, how do you know if it's cooked? It looks the fucking same! <laughs> it's very stressful. <laughs> you know? She's constantly stored under my phone as mum, not an emergency contact. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up in care, is that right? I grew up in and out of foster yeah. care. So yeah, so I'd lived with my mum and then I went into sort of temporary foster care. And then I went uh, to live with foster parents. I actually lived on a farm uh, with a couple called Auntie Dot and Uncle Harold, who were not actually my aunt and uncle. Uh, but the government like to tr trick you into thinking you're related. So, <laughs> so if you're not confused enough. Um, and then after that, I went to live with my grandmother. Yeah. And then at 15, I went back into supported housing. So kind of in and out, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. okay. And so you've, you've used those experiences quite a lot in your... Because you, you do comedy and theatre and you also do, you, you, you do stuff... Uh, 
with the, within the care community as well, yeah? Well, uh, yeah, so I, I sort of started out, uh, when I was about 20, I started out doing theatre, and then I kind of got into producing. Yeah. Because I worked with a, a, a theatre in Manchester called Contact Theatre, who were all about making sure that as artists or performers or writers that you were self-produced artists, writers and performers. And your kind of political drive was at the root of everything. So that was the mentoring that I was given, really. Yeah. And then from that, it was, you know, it was about how do you produce your own projects. I produced a lot of projects that were around creating, you know, kind of artistically engaged social projects in cer certain areas. So I did a lot with sort of racial conflicts in Bolton. Yeah. And then that kind of moved on. And then I started working with kids in Kerr a little bit outside of that. And then in 2015, I set up my own project called Sophie Willen's Stories of Kerr, uh, that was kind of a multi-platform project with, I think, 12 partners. And we raised £150,000 to kind of... Brilliant. Oh, no, 110000 I've added on an extra forty. <laughs> but fucking no, isn't it? £110,000 to kind of... It was all about redressing the balance, really, between the kind of negative you know, representation of care leavers and, yeah. you know, mental health users and social service users and welfare recipients that seem to get worse and worse from 2007 onwards. Yes. Yeah, which yeah. really pissed me off, actually. Well, there's so. a lot of, you know, those sort of Channel 4 well, they were, scroungers sort of Yeah, programs. Benefit Street, yeah, yeah. Bring Back the Borstal, Loose Women, you know, all these <laughs> cunty shows. I just got so angry and yeah. I just thought... I couldn't see anybody representing my people here, and I, it wasn't positive when they were represented. And I thought there needs to be a balance. And now it's getting a bit more in the kind of zeitgeist, that conversation again, which sure. is great. But at the time it wasn't, and it was really irritating. Well, but it's you interesting know. that you've, you know, you've got up and done that yourself. A mm -hmm. lot of people say, oh, you know, actors, theatre's full of eat people from eating well, I, them. Well, I say theatre, I didn't, it was, it was a, basically a youth club in Manchester, <laughs> so it wasn't, it's kind of in between theatre yeah. and, you know, it kind of was a, a place that had live art and cabaret and theatre and lots of different, and it was all about being a self-produced artist, so not like a sort of actor, yeah. I suppose. You, you wrote yourself, you produced yourself, you set up your own companies and... Yeah, but it's the creative, you know, like, I think a lot yeah. of people think, oh, those avenues aren't open to me, and I, understandably, because... It's harder and harder. I think, well, they're not, get... are they? No, they really? aren't. <laughs> you know, but not. then if you create your own, you know, you, exactly, it's the exact same. Any, people say, oh, how do I get started in comedy? How do I get started in mm. writing? But I you wanted to and... be like Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. You know, instead I'm doing stand-up comedy. I mean, that's, <laughs> you find your avenue, don't you? But it's usually the fucking cleaner in Pride and Prejudice when you've got the Northern accent, you know? Yeah. So you find whatever in you, and you've just got to go with where your natural... Uh, where people will naturally place you, I yeah. suppose, at first. Yeah, it was tricky. But so, I mean, you've you felt that there's this sort of, I mean, there obviously is this patronising attitude, and then you got you got fated as being this working class comedian, even, and you know, and, and but you felt that was. Well, so I did a show called was, On Record that yeah. was kind of about um, getting my records back from social services, and kind of reclaiming the negative language around mental health, social services, and. Curl leavers, and I focused specifically on three words that were mentioned in my files, rebellious, defiant, and rude. Surprisingly came up a lot, I don't know why. <laughs> and by the end, I sort of reclaimed those words, you know, rebellious as a sign of creativity, defiant as a sign of a strong will, rude, well, I'm just fucking honest, aren't I? <laughs> and uh, one thing I did as well is looked at my family members, because a lot of them, like Maria's lot, yeah. struggled with psychosis. Um, and obviously they did that research recently that proves that successful comedians have more psychotic traits than anybody else yeah. in any other profession. So I think said, I'd be doing better. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I said, well, that's great for me, isn't it? Because I'm genetically wired to be fucking hilarious, you know. <laughs> and a lot of the show is about kind of celebrating the attributes that come along with certain taboo mental health issues. Yeah. And then at the end, I did sort of reviews of family members right. that kind of were called back to the beginning. So... Uncle John, uh, who's a schizophrenic who spends most of his time laughing into a packet of pork scratchings in Weatherspoons. At the end, you know, did Chortle says, absurdist comedian Uncle John discusses life and love with a packet of pork scratchings. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of a redressing. But after that, 
a lot of what people said was, oh, working class comedian, oh, brilliant. We've got a northern female working class comedian. Come on, Sophie, quick, grab your clogs and you whip it, let's go. <laughs> So, yeah, it's... I mean, it is. It's, it, you know, the circuit is a very middle-class place, I think, the comedy circuit. And, you know, and again, come, especially if you're coming to London, you sort of need to have some... When I came to London, you didn't need any kind of backup plan or any, you know... Yeah. I, I could, you, I've got on the Enterprise Alliance, I've got a job where I earn £100 a week, yeah. and that was enough to survive on. But the idea of that now would be laughable for anyone coming to, coming to London. So if you're trying to make it as a comedian... It is difficult if you're if you're starting with nothing and you know and and no route through that way. So that's yeah. why I think you do you know you do tend to see. Get... And it's good. I suppose it's, it's quite oversaturated. Yeah. there. there's a lot of people, isn't there? In... There is, and you know, and I suppose it's it's the similar thing with all all these aspects where we're talking about whether women and ethnic minorities and everyone are getting involved in the entertainment industry. If the people at the top are all of a certain type of people, which they are from twenty yeah. or thirty years ago, it's difficult to break through that that barrier. Yeah, I said I that actually recently. It's like the diversity needs to come from the gatekeepers, doesn't it? Yeah. Not just kind of tokenistic. Oh, quick, we need one of those. You know, grab them quick. You know, because that's not going to work. Is no, it? no. If the gatekeepers are more diverse, then they'll authentically pick people that they relate to. Because it's all about who you relate to, isn't it? It's very it is, subjective. Up to some so. extent, but you know, I think I think also, you know, you can, you can. If you like comedy, you can watch any kind of person doing comedy. You know, you don't have to be, you know, you have to grow up in a in a, a, a brothel like Richard Pryor's family yeah, did to, to understand why Richard Pryor. No, is but amazing, I suppose yeah. that you're more likely to pick stuff that you go, that is the best of that because yeah. you relate to, it or you understand it, or it's all it's authentic. Whereas if you're trying to find it, you might miss it if yeah. you don't know it as authentically. You and, know, and that's okay, isn't it? Because there's so many different types of people and. Everybody's voice has a place, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You well, know? that's you know, but and also you want different stories and you want different voices in stories. You know, yeah. it's kind of and you want different voices on the stand-up <laughs> on the stand-up yeah. bill. And from the producer level yeah, as well, you yeah. want more different voices, yeah. don't you? Not just the actual acts themselves. Yeah, but the danger is, I mean, and I don't think this has happened to you at all, but it's the danger is if people are like looking for the new, they oh, we need that, we need yeah. that. You get grabbed too quickly. You know, you're not ready for the, that next move up, and then it's sort of. You see, I've seen people where that's happened, where they get taken in, they go, yeah. here's your, you know, 15 minutes in a show, or here's your show, and then they haven't got enough experience to... What do you mean 15 minutes? Well, you show? know, they, they, they get picked out, you know, people are looking for new people all the time, right, which is understandable, mm. and then you put them straight on the telly, then they're not ready for that, you know, they haven't done enough of yeah. the, the groundwork in the, in the background, and, and then it can be a negative thing if you discover too soon, if you see what I mean. I think you're definitely yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I but agree. I mean, it sounds like you've got a, a good grounding in having done all this stuff. I think in the it's past been different because well. even though I've been doing stand up for like three years, I've actually been working as a writer for 10, mm. actually, and a producer for 10. So I did theatre, I've done plays, you know, plays, ensembles, and then solo plays. And then I went into stand up with all that. So that's why my shows are kind of structured. Yeah. I was to have that narrative. And there's a, there yeah. seems to be people seem to be going to theatre a lot more, which is again the interesting. So the TV companies are with Fleabag and Chewing Gum. Yeah, these have come kind of from a theatrical background as well, which can be positive, can't yeah. it? But no, then definitely. also on the other side, it's good to have like you know I love just straight stand up sure. power. Yeah, you know. That's, yeah, yeah it's, no, it's, well, it's, I think it's important to keep, you know, I just think things stagnate every now and again, you know, and I, I think when I started doing stand-up in the early, early eight, 90s, um, in the late 80s, um, you know, it, it stagnated a bit. The 80s have been really interesting and then the 90s were quite boring load of blokes doing gags, really. Yeah. And I didn't feel, I, I felt when I came back to doing stand-up in 2004, I kind of fitted more in because I, I, I didn't, I wasn't like the, it was a lot of laddie, high-status men doing you know, quite... Yeah. Quite, Where did you fit in that? Well, I fit in more in low-status, weird, and people doing... <laughs> well, I don't quite I don't quite fit in either world, but, you know, there was a lot more weird stuff going on. Again, like, imagine the 80s was very, very yeah. weird and lots of people who were genuinely crazy. I mean, there is this... Com there is this connection between being slightly crazy and being a comedian. Yeah. And it's, it was, you know, you see it with Maria, and then you... But then, obviously, with Maria... It had gone. To, it goes too. It's not like oh, you might. It must be great having a mental illness. You must be funny all the no, time because no, because no, obviously it's a a negative uh, thing. It's a hard thing to go to control. Through, yeah, isn't it? you yeah. can't control it by its very nature. Yeah. So, but but it, obviously there is a connection. I, I think there is. They say it's because like comedians connect thoughts that are never normally connected in mm. the same that way that people with psychosis do. So yeah. your thoughts are like really you know abstract and abstractly connected yeah 
with a bit know. of control, maybe. I mean, that's a bit with the understanding of why those two things are odd. Those, yeah, yeah, why they're odd together. If you're yeah, just... like my mum often thinks that Freddie Mercury is speaking to her. He's not. <laughs> a comedian would know he's not. Yeah. My mum has no fucking idea. So that's the. But and also, I think a lot of comedy is sort of faking. You know, is pushing things and faking being crazy a little yeah. bit as well. I suppose so playing up to your persona, yeah, yeah. whatever that is. Because I guess, it, yeah. you know, maybe it goes. But I mean, it might go back through history to crazy people. You know, like the the courts of the royal families used to be just full of. They'd get crazy people in. Partly as entertainment, partly as wise. In the courts? You know, in the courts, like in the Russian court. I was oh, talking wow. about it on Netflix, uh, my Rasputin <laughs> document. But the, the Russian courts had, like, a variety of, of, like, wise people who were, you know... So it's like Jerry Springer for... Well, uh, <laughs> not courts, but, like, the royal courts where, you know, like, jesters, rather. So they're, like, coming in, but, like, why... What, the, the wise fools <laughs> and people with epilepsy basically coming in and rolling around on the floor and then someone going... This means you should go to war with Germany, you know. So it's that kind of thing. God. Yeah. yeah. So there's a connection. <laughs> there's a connection through history, I think, with all of this. But there we go. Um, luckily, I was more more eloquent on uh, Netflix. <laughs> that boy, bloody wasn't it? Was cold in that studio. Um, so what does the Carolina Hearn bursary in, involve? What do you, do you do? You have to do a certain. I don't think you have to do anything actually. I okay. think you win it, which is yeah, good, nice. and then you decide what you doing afterwards so I think what I want to do is hopefully develop a sitcom with it, which I've done lots of different treatments over years and, and written up pilots yeah. and different things so it's nice now to have a that with a bit of backing I suppose sure, sure. I'm going to do another one and and hopefully hopefully get it commissioned yeah know. So they've yeah. given you they've given you some money and that gives you a bit of freedom. They give you a bit of money and then hopefully maybe a script commission as yeah. well. You know, right. double whammy would be fabulous, wouldn't it? So <laughs> that's great. Right, I'll ask you some emergency questions. Oh right, okay. See how we go. Um, gonna be different ones. If every time you farted a fairy died an agonizing death, would you stop farting? If I probably wouldn't fuck him. <laughs> I... <laughs> Fair enough. Um, have you ever improvised a condom? I haven't, but I'm no. intrigued now what you would do. Well, Your instinct is thing. a plastic bag, isn't it? I, yeah. What would you do? Um, well, I would, I'm very careful and I would buy prophylactics from the shop. <laughs> and have when you have sex have every my, 10 years. I have them in my wallet <laughs> until the, the sell-by date went by. Um, I don't think I would, you know, yeah, I don't think I would... Uh, you can just kiss and stuff, can't you? Why not? Yeah. Don't, need, don't need to go all the way. Um, what is the most, uh, the strangest things you've ever found in the embers of a bonfire? I don't think I've ever searched a bonfire. What have you search. been doing with bonfire I found, I found my, Well, our first cat I found in the embers of a bonfire. Did you? Yeah. God, that's a psychotic that's you, that's, episode that's I've ever heard of, isn't it? One of my earliest memories. <laughs> No, I don't think I've ever found any. I've never no. looked, actually. Don't have a look. Next time you're near a bonfire, there have a go. look in there. I bet you'll I find will. something. I bet if you go back to Bolton, you'll find some good stuff in I'm there. I'm sure, definitely. They burn, yeah. they burn all sorts of stuff <laughs> up there. Um, if you uh, were going to be put in a human centipede, <laughs> are you aware of the human centipede franchise? No. Mm. <laughs> There's a film called The Human Centipede in which a mad doctor uh, stitches uh, three people together. What with the them, fuck? with them, with their, um, the mouth. Well, the first person's mouth is fine. Then right. their, but their, their bottom is stitched to the mouth of the second person, and then their bottom is stitched. <laughs> I'm sorry to shock you, Sophie. Yeah, this is. <laughs> so what? I have to pick three people. Well, I want you're to in be the middle. To. You're in the. You're in the middle. Who would you like in? You get. You get to choose who would be in front of you and who would be behind. <laughs> That's a tricky evening, isn't it? <laughs> And it's for life, you know. Your life won't be very long, though, so... Oh, God. Who would I want that with? I feel... David Attenborough. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> is he ahead or behind? Are you eating David Attenborough's poo or are you pooing the poo? I think of... he feels... I, I think... I, no, I, I don't want to eat his shit. I don't know where he's been. He's been all over the world, hasn't he? Yes. I? I think I'd like to hear him narrate what's happening to okay. us. It would be interesting. Well, that's not really in the question, but I will allow it. I'm going to yeah. allow it. And then who's at the bottom end? I don't know. 
Cheryl Cole. She doesn't seem like she'd ever shit. So I think that would be. Okay. So Cheryl Cole on the front, and you're shitting into the mouth of David Attenborough, and he's going. I'm shitting. Ah, I thought it was ah. Cheryl. No, you're in the middle. Oh right. Okay. Well, you're both yeah, well, fine. in the middle. They're both the, both the first and the second person. I love Cheryl and, and David Attenborough. That's good. That's a good yeah. choice. <laughs> It's a very good choice. Um, <laughs> let me get back to my uh, notes. Uh, so, um, I won't ask you that. That's about that's for uh, Maria Bamford. So, well, that's, you worked as a sex worker. Uh, you talk about in your in your set. Yes. And so, I, I'm interested. So I in the, let him stumble I'm over interested that. Into <laughs> the, I'm interested in a lot of things about this, but I'm interested in the reaction you got from from other feminist acts as much as... What do you mean in this show well, that I talk about it yeah, or just you, in well, general? Yeah, in general as well. Okay. You, 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 you talked about this, about helping you get you through this period of creativity uh, by earning some money in that way. Uh, but that, that, you know, the, that some feminists find that an, an unacceptable way to behave. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I sat up, like, cause I was, like I said, I did a feminist collective in my early 20s. And I set it up with a group of women who, uh, you know, they were lovely. Uh, you know, they all had good backgrounds and bedtimes. And, you know, the kind of women who could eat half a Kit Kat and save the other half for later. <laughs> I really admired them. And, um, you know, I set this collective up as well because I was really up for it, you know. So I paid for the website, paid for the directors, you know, paid for everything. Um, and I told one of them that was working as an escort, and she said, Sophie, that's so unfeminist, very judgmental. And it really pissed me off, actually, but not at the time. I was, I was full of shame at the time, you know. It was only afterwards I thought, God, you know, it always becomes a feminist issue, doesn't it, escorting and sex work? Yeah. And it's actually the only industry, you know, in this kind of patriarchal world that becomes a feminist issue, actually. We don't go into telesales offices, do we, and go, oh, Sue on the phones. You know, is she empowered? Or is she just selling carpets because she's a middle child? We don't. <laughs> you don't, so it annoyed me, you know. And I thought, well, I paid for the website, I paid for the directors, I paid... So technically, the, the, the Feminist Collective had been seed-funded on prostitution. <laughs> it's the irony. So I sort of wanted to write about that in the show, really, yeah. and talk about that judgment, because I do think that, you know... A lot of the conversations around feminism are dominated by women from good backgrounds sure. who set the ideals for everybody based on what's been possible for them. And yeah. never does it become a social thing, you know, or a class thing or any, any of the other things. It's always a feminist issue. So I suppose that's what I wanted to kind of look at, yeah. really. Yeah. And also just to go <laughs> to them, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Was, it, was that a hard choice for you to, to go into that? Or was that just... Was it a what, the escort? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I was really young, so I was like 20. And, you know, you're sort of mental, aren't you, at 20? Not that you get less mental, but <laughs> slightly, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, so I was sort of in denial about it. And I don't think it was sexually empowering, even though at the time I pretended it was, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was economically empowering. I mean, it meant that I could, you know, set up these collectives. I could do loads of different things. But it wasn't, I think, an easy thing to do. No. No. And I wouldn't do it now. I don't think I'd be able to do that now. And I've since done loads of therapy, so I don't think I'd be able to do it now. Because you, you're basically going into rooms and you're performing at people, aren't you? Yeah. Which is not a very authentic, healthy thing to do, is it? You know? Well, it <laughs> is. You know? Well, I have, you know, I've, there, there's, uh, Stuart actually used to do a routine about how he thought uh, being, a, well, uh, tongue-in-cheek slightly, but how he thought stand-up comedy and sex work that, are the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're basically going in rooms with strangers going, love me for money, you know. <laughs> so it is a... Yeah, at least escort work is more honest than what we're doing here. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> We all know what we're Less doing damaging, before. though. Yeah. You know, because it is mental, I think, the, the escorting thing, you know. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a weird world, isn't it? But I didn't want to write a whole show on that because yeah. I don't think it should be glorified or, you know, it often gets too much attention. It's either glorified or demonised or, you know, dramatised. Yeah. And actually, I think it would, I just wanted to use it as a tool to talk about labelling in general sure. as opposed to... Did the guys who came to you sort out their parking beforehand? <laughs> or did they... You'd hope did so. They... I mean, Cause... some were taxi drivers. I mean, I don't know what they did. So, you know... 
because I had this experience like I was talking about last week in which I was held up at the hotel by a man who wanted to park for cheaply before he went upstairs with an escort, but was trying yes, to... Yes, I saw yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I just wondered whether he was typical. Were they quite penny-pinching the guys around, <laughs> around the restaurant? It depends, really. I mean, I was quite lucky. They were quite generous. Yeah. But, you know, it was before the credit crunch. So I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Things changed, you know. And do you find the kind of confessional aspect of your work is? Do you find that liberating? Do you think once you've talked about these things that it sort of frees you up, or does it? I'd like to think not. I'd like to think you go for therapy first, and then yeah. you talk about it on stage. Not that it's cathartic in the action. Yeah, As... I definitely don't. I definitely use it as therapy. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> When I don't have much... When I was in my 30s, I think like I used a lot of the shows as a way of kind of fighting through things that were bothering me. I've yeah. never been for therapy. Have you not? No. Oh, God, you do very well Thank in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but I always found my shows quite helpful, you know, in the end. Some of them I was, like, really properly depressed while I was doing them. Oh, that's amazing. I couldn't um, do that. I, I tried to write a show about my mum, like, a few years before, and yeah. I couldn't do it because I hadn't processed it and... I just felt that I wasn't able to look at it objectively. And I suppose because I, I like to have a, a bird's eye view on it and my story just be a kind of tool to talk about other things. Yeah. Whereas if you don't know what you think about or feel about something, yeah. I don't know if you'd be objective on it. But, yeah, but I mean, you know, you're working through it as you do. I mean, that's, that was my way of, of thinking about something, I suppose. I don't think yeah. none of my problems have ever been and on the level. Like you say, I, I, I've, I've come from a... A, a nice background where I have loving parents. And, it's still you know, hard to do, isn't it? Yeah, no, yeah, it's hard. To, but you know, but you, you're maybe trying that's to... better actually to do it as you go in. Yeah, because it. You know, well, I think you find you find truths, and because over I... the period of shows that you do on tour, you probably discover things. Yeah, whereas yeah. I'm like, oh fucking hell, this again. You know? <laughs> I already know. You know yeah. I do, well, I think like a lot of the truths that come out of comedy that are the serious truths. Yeah. I think are fairly basic and obvious, but most people don't get a chance to stop and think about them. So like, whenever I do a show about something, like the uh, Happy Now is about whether happiness is attainable or, what, yeah, or, yeah. or, or whether desirable, really. And you, if you think about it, you realise, well, actually, if you were happy all the time, that would be really fucking weird. We're yeah, not meant yeah. to be in a, in a, in a, in a state Constant of happiness. State, yeah. Because it, if we were, it wouldn't be meaningless anyway, because you need to be unhappy for happiness to have any meaning. And yeah. it's so obvious, but I think with that, if I hadn't sat down to really think through what I was, you know, whether I was content and what that meant... Yeah. You know, so you get to hopefully you're, you're pushing towards in that subject you're pushing towards, um, you know, being less unhappy. Yeah. Uh, but, but you need <laughs> to working it out. As yeah, you're but going. you need to have had the unhappiness for the for happiness to mean anything, and you also need to be aware that the happiness is a fleeting. Com- yeah, that it's yeah. going to go as well. You know, life goes bad at the end. This is really uplifting. <laughs> but that's it. But so, the, but all these things are interesting, and then they yeah. are. You know, but I think that's the what you know. If you if your job isn't to sit down and think about a subject for six months and then do yeah. jokes about it. You don't necessarily even just think of these very basic truths. And what I'm saying, I didn't anyway. Until I sat down and thought about these things, that didn't really properly strike me. You know? So yeah. I, think, I think you can work your way through quite complicated ideas and, and come to a very simple truth. And it's. I think ideas are different to like emotional trauma. Yeah. I think you, know, you have to have dealt with some of... Like, I don't think you can work out your emotional trauma on a tour. <laughs> on a rural tour, it's only going to get worse, isn't it? But you I think know? some comics do. I think comics do. It's not like uh, over a few years. I think some comics yeah, do. So I probably, think comics yeah. and some you see comedians go through. Well, you know, again, Maria was talking about that, like having that yeah. point where she broke down and what she was saying was nonsense, and people said it's time to go to the hospital, yeah. <laughs> basically. But you know, some comedians you'll see them go through those moments and think, okay, maybe it's time to go to the hospital. Someone to tell you to stop taking yeah. cocaine every night uh, <laughs> or whatever it is they're doing. But you know, it's, I, I think you exactly. I think the worst thing I found is just like repeating myself you know the things that you've said you know a thousand times the epiphanies you've had you know 68 shows ago you yeah. still say no and you just think oh god you drive yourself mad with your own story <laughs> you know it is difficult i mean that's a difficult thing but i think again that with experience yeah. of doing loads and loads of of shows yeah i got to a point where I, when i was doing shows 10 or 15 years ago if if you came and saw me halfway through the tour it wasn't that good because yeah. I got a bit bored of it, and you know, if the audience weren't immediately grabbing it, I was going, right, fuck you now, right. fuck well, you. So you got but now, but now, I, I trying to, you're trying to make it better every time. Yeah. And you'd get used to that, I think. But it's, yeah, it's. Yeah. I think you just feel sometimes a bit, you know, it's like you, you, your whole identity thing can get a bit. You, you wear yourself out with your own identity. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's just like. Yeah, yeah. 
but then it's constant. about I think it's about yeah. finding your your which I think you seem to have found very quickly you've founded your your center and your character on stage which is you so like again you know quickly ish but then when I was in theater it was like we weren't acting we were doing solo autobiographical stuff yeah. and for ages I was a bit like my gran um, and then before that, I was dressing up as a cat, so I was getting everything out yeah. that I felt, but with ears on. So, you know, it's like you, you have different <laughs> lives, don't you? And then yeah. you've, I think you finally settle into it. Maybe. And how have the people around you reacted? So your family, are they, are they, they, you know, you, I don't know how much of it's true, the stuff I've heard. You're talking about your families and their different problems. I think but... they feel positive because I don't think I say anything mean. You know, it's not coming from a mean spirited place yeah you know like say my mum looks like iggy pop does now it's quite a compliment <laughs> um, <laughs> you know and also we've all got a sense of humor so i do think that helps you know yeah i think yeah. you do get that humor when you've had that kind of background together you know yeah yeah it's all very interesting stuff. What's Ryan like in real life? Is he nice? It's lovely. His teeth, you can see your own yeah, reflection big. in. They're so, big. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he seems nice, though. Yeah. yeah. He's lucky, isn't he? So, um, <laughs> and you've just started a uh, Radio 4 show that's about to go out this week. By the time this yeah. is out, it might have all been out. What, is it a, like a four-part or a six-part? Four, part, part. four parts. And yeah. what's it about? Um, it's called Sophie Willen's Guide to Normality. So it's a look at what is kind of normal expectations. And each episode is an instruction that we might be given. Okay. You know, like, be a parent, get a job, be polite. I uh, can't remember that. Do monogamy. And each one of them is a look at that and maybe kind of slightly challenging of that. Okay. So what about monogamy? What's, what, what are you challenging in monogamy? Because monogamy is great and I won't have a word said against. <laughs> it's nothing better than being in a monogamous relationship. But I just say maybe there's other options, yeah. you know. And then I say, you know, I'm, you know, I wouldn't say I'm promiscuous, but I'm more of an anthropologist, you know. So, so <laughs> I just look at being maybe more creative with the... Uh, the restrictions of monogamy, and especially, you know, being a woman who's turned 30, there's expectations that you need to settle down and have a baby and buy a house and, you know, do all that. Yeah, so you, you're not... You, is that not something that interests you? Are you settling down or is it... Well, I've just that... left a relationship. So, yeah, five years. And then I came to London, uh, chopped my hair off and dyed it ginger, so it's been quite a year, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so that's probably why that episode happened. Yeah, I do yeah. say at the beginning, you know, just disclaimers, just so you know, I'm quite raw from a breakup. So yeah. it's a See, but there you go. episode. So you're working through your relationship there breakup. You go. And yeah. through comedy. That's true. Which actually. is what I did all through my 30s before going, oh, fuck it, I'll be monogamous then. <laughs> yeah. You've ground me down with yeah. your love. Uh, with your amazing love. Uh, your dad isn't Richard Ascroft uh, of The Verve. Neither is no. mine. We've got that in common. God, yeah. <laughs> Why did you think he was the, your dad? Um, or did you think he was? Because my grandma told me that he was. <laughs> so it's not a great start, is it? And she'd heard from my mum, who had drug-induced psychosis at the time, but we didn't question it. Um, and they look very similar. And they're both from Wigan. <laughs> um, and they're both quite tall and thin. Yeah. And my dad is the same age as Richard Ashcroft. Mm -hmm. And they went off the same year to go cold turkey and become rock stars. Okay. Um, so obviously, you know, in 1997 when that song came out, the drugs don't work, they just make you worse, but I know I'll see your face again. We thought that's him, isn't it? And he's speaking to me personally. So, <laughs> I know. so I started writing letters to Richard Ashcroft oh, wow. for quite a while. Yeah. And did he write back? No, he did not. He did <laughs> Because, hello, I'm your, I'm your secret daughter. Uh, can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> and also, because there's lots of men that look like him around Bolton and Wigan. And there's loads of kids without dads. So he was probably getting a real influx of letters. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying. And some of them will be his kids, probably. Yeah, yeah. probably. Just the law of averages. <laughs> um, I'm sure he, uh, they aren't. I don't know why I said such a thing. But if Richard Ashcroft of The Verve is listening... <laughs> the drugs don't work though, mate. Well done, that was correct. Um, I'll give you that. Um, <laughs> cool, I'll, do, I'll, I'll try a random emergency question. There was one I wanted to... Uh, there's one I wanted to ask you. Let's see if it pops up. It might not. Um, it hasn't. What is your favourite bun that is named after a place? These are fucking surreal, aren't they? Yeah, they are. That's the um, point. Yeah, no, bun. This is the fourth best comedy book. 
<laughs> what bun? What is bun. A, I'm just trying to think of yeah. buns. I, Bath bun. Shh, no, bun, right. Chelsea okay. bun. All right, don't steal all the buns. I'll have none left. <laughs> What, what kind of they bun in? is there? Where's the hot cross bun? Yeah, that's not named after a place. Well, I mean, it, I suppose it is named after a very specific Big, place. Well, uh, named after the cross of <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah, thank you. On yeah. the, the hill what of are the buns Golgotha. Are there? Is that right? Uh, I don't know. I'm, you know. I'm interested in finding it. Mine's, my favourite one's the Chelsea bun. Right, OK. Yeah, that's lovely. <laughs> what buns do they eat in Bolton? You are? What, what's the Bolton bun? Do they, what kind I don't of think they have a bun. They've got... Oh, um, come on, they must have buns uh, They've got uh, balm cakes. Okay. Yeah. Someone, someone went, going, yeah. yeah, someone yeah, bought Is there someone this? from Bolton? Eccles. Oh, yeah, Eccles you've got cake. Eccles cakes. Yeah, there's lots of cakes, but yeah. I don't know about buns. Chorley cake. Yeah. Batewell tart. Manchester tart. Pontefract cakes. Fabulous, yeah. They're just bits of licorice, though, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, who they Who remembers are. Pontefract cakes? My grandma loves them. My granddad used to have them. She used to time. throw them out on the roof. I used to think they were 2p coins. <laughs> why did she throw them out on the roof? If she didn't like them. <laughs> <laughs> why, did she, why, why didn't she learn that she didn't like them? <laughs> no. If it was a sunny day, you'd just think they were two pences. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have got onto something, the most interesting thing in that. <laughs> Why did you think some bits of licorice were two pences? The way the sun shimmered on them. <laughs> <laughs> they look lovely. Yeah. Right, a play about that. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Um, if you had to marry a piece of furniture, if you had to, which piece of furniture would you wed? A fire. I love fires. Fire. <laughs> I love fires. Like oh, open fires. Yeah. yeah I'd, I'd, but you've I'd never looked that. in the embers of one. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, yeah, do that. Yeah. They are not. I've got an open fire in my house. It's my they're beautiful. Yeah, aren't they? it's amazing. It's just showing off now. I am you? showing off, but it's, it's very nice, and I fuck it all the time. <laughs> really burns, burns your, it burns your knob. <laughs> got to be careful. <laughs> got to use some kind of prophylactic. I use uh, asbestos. <laughs> um. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Um, if you, this is a good question. I don't think I've asked this one before, and I think the other person to answer this question. They're not all childish, Sophie. I don't know what you're thinking. I'm a childish person. <laughs> if you could choose which liquid you weed, you can have any liquid, what liquid would you wee? Gold. Wouldn't you liquid gold? A liquid gold. That'd be wouldn't very that be, lucrative that, business, wouldn't Wouldn't it? that be very hot, though? I mean, a liquid gold is... It's going to be, be hot, but you'd be fucking loaded, wouldn't you? It'd be all right, wouldn't it? <laughs> Your urethra, though. You think of your poor urethra. What well, liquid would be ideal to come out of your urethra? Not if it's boiling up gold. Melting point is... Yeah. 500 degrees Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, that guy says that's right. <laughs> that's good. What would you... How would you market your gold wee? So would you want to buy uh, Sophie Willen's gold, golden yeah, wee? So organically uh, <laughs> produced... Uh, on site. Yeah. I can give you a golden shower. Oh! That's disgusting, wasn't it? <laughs> and kill you. Yeah. I could kill you like a goldfinger. I mean, it's a different yeah. version of goldfinger, isn't it? But there we go. Yeah. That's a campaign number two. <laughs> okay. Why did Itsu in Notting Hill change from a sit down sushi restaurant with all the stuff going around on a conveyor belt to just selling stuff out of fridges? What was the. Why did Itsu, it's a sushi restaurant oh, yeah. in Notting Hill, me and my wife used to go a lot when we lived in West London, it changed from a sit-down sushi restaurant where there was a conveyor belt going around yeah, yeah. to just one where you get stuff out of fridges and take them to your workplace. Why well, did that happen? <laughs> Maybe because just people got a bit depressed <laughs> um, and didn't have time to sit around the conveyor I don't belt. want speculation, I want the actual answer oh, to right, okay. why, why they made this... Because everyone's on the go now, and it's to... Yeah, but it was nice to sit... You know, it came round, didn't it? Yeah. I thought we... Yeah, OK. Yeah, maybe you weren't the right person Maybe somebody sat on the conveyor belt. <laughs> <laughs> they may have done. Uh, I went to... When I was in Melbourne, I went to uh, one where it's on a train. Sushi came on a train. It was really... That's it, was, it, was called, it was called Sushi Train. On a little... Yeah, like came round on a thing. Oh, have you been to Australia? Have you played Australia? No, but I'm doing that next yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, I knew you were going out. So yeah. you're looking forward... Were you playing the Melbourne Festival? Yes. Ooh, it's yeah, really lovely. Have you ever been to Australia at I've all? I've not, no. Ooh, yeah, I'm it's much nicer than it. England. 
Is it? Yeah, and it's hot out there now. Yeah, really someone nice. said it's autumn, but I think they were yeah, joking. Yeah, it's still it's, Well, no, it's probably is coming into. They've had summer, but it's still ridiculously still hot. Still lovely. And yeah. the food's really nice. I haven't been yeah. for about 15 years. It might have changed. There's a <laughs> lot of racists there. Yeah, I've heard this. Just in yeah. Australia, generally. <laughs> if you get a chance, go and like go around into the centre, though. You're going you're yeah. to have a holiday there when you, after I you've hope, done... Well, I've only there for the month, which yeah. is the festival, but okay. you get Mondays off, so... Yeah, you, can't, you haven't got time to go into the centre of Australia on Monday. Do you not? <laughs> no. Oh, that's a joke. <laughs> Takes a couple of days. We drove... Um, Where's the centre, then? Is that Sydney? Well, no, every, there's, there's not really it's anything... all right, Mr. Jog with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know about the geography of Australia? <laughs> it's all around the edge in Australia. They waste a lot of space in Australia. There's a lot in the middle they don't really do anything with. Right, OK. Uh, and everyone's around the edge because they like surfing, I think. I think that's the reason. I've got uh, brothers and sisters there, actually. Have you? I've not met them, but they're there. Oh, cool. So I might try and do that or just... Uh, invite them to the show, it's, maybe, but they're younger than me. It's either. a very interesting country, and, mm. and it's beautiful. And then, the, in, but then you've got the Uluru in the middle, is uh, in the middle of the country. Yes, so you can I. fly out there. <laughs> he calls it Ayers Rock, man. That's how stupid he, that guy is. Uh, there's a big, big stu- rock in the middle. But we drove. I drove there with Phil Granchy from Modern Problems in Science in 1997. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's you get an, an aspect on. A, how racist the country is, and B, <laughs> and how, what a bad time the Aboriginal people of uh, Australia have, uh, and uh, this amazing kind of... There's nothing, and then there's this big red rock in the middle. Right. If you get a chance yeah, to go... Yeah, we'll have a look, yeah. Yeah, fly out. Yeah. Fly out in a helicopter for the day. Yes, yeah, so um, on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and so what else is... What's, what else is planned? Are you, are you writing a new show for Edinburgh? No, I'm, I'm not going to do a show this year okay. and then have a year off and then go back the next year. A good year. call. Yeah, I think you've got to have something to say again, don't you? Or something yeah, you want I think to write or yeah. an interest. I'm not well, gonna... you know, I've, I've managed to just keep on going back with nothing to say, but I, <laughs> I, 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 think, it's, I think it's the right idea. Um, I'm not doing it this year either. Yeah, oh, that's no. what are you up to then? I'm just going to take some time off. It's tiring doing this, having ki- yeah. comedy and doing... Imagine having kids as well. It's a pain in the arse. Yeah, I've never had them. Yeah, exhausting, yeah. idiots. Could you so give them stupid. back? What could you do with them? They're so stupid, you can't, you're not allowed. You're not allowed to put them in the wood burner. <laughs> it's just, you know, what can you do with them? So I thought I'd hang around with them for a bit. Yeah, that's instead nice. Instead of going yeah. to Edinburgh. Though Edinburgh's quite nice because you can hang, if you did have kids, don't have kids, but if you did have kids, I mean, it's your choice. Uh, I understand, unless, you know, the Conservatives get a bit more power and then it's not your choice anymore. Uh, unless Margaret Atwood's vision of the future comes true, in which case, yeah, okay, I'll shut up. Um, it's, no, you know, it's, it's, not, it's a good place to go to with kids because you get to hang around with them in the day. When you're touring, you don't get That's to see your family. That's in Melbourne. Well, Melbourne or, or, or anywhere that you stay in one place. Melbourne's, yeah. Melbourne's a really great festival. I'm sure you'll have a, a fantastic time out there because it's nice to come as a, you know, someone with some impetus behind with you. and something do, doing, yeah. 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 Which which room are you playing? Do you know what the I've room no is? No idea. I've I've not had a look, but I'm excited. I think it'd be good. <laughs> you know, it's fun. It's, you'll have a lot of fun. Yeah, you'll have a lot of fun out there. So, um, who would win in a fight, King Kong or King Dong? <laughs> Do you know who King Dong is? No. You're so young. Who is King Dong? King Dong um, was he? Uh, he was someone who was supposed to have a 22-inch penis. Uh, so but just when a porn he, star. when he, well, he sort of was. But when it supposedly, when I don't think it was real, <laughs> supposedly when he got an erection, um, he fainted because of the l- 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 well, loss of. Well, he wouldn't win in a fight. Loss of <laughs> well, he could use his flaccid penis to hit. I don't think anyone would beat King Kong. Really, a it's a stupid penis question. Would be quite powerful yeah. at that size. Wouldn't yeah, it? you've got twenty-two inches. Yeah. You can get it yeah. up to King Kong's level. You'd have to kind of get him to pick you up somehow. <laughs> then I think King yeah. that would just King Kong would just. It would yeah. enrage him. It would make him more annoyed. Yeah. It's a stupid question in many ways, Sophie. <laughs> uh, why can't we live forever? It'd be quite boring, wouldn't it? It would be boring. Yeah. It'd be awful. You would do everything. And then uh, what? And then it would still... I think the, the worst thing about living forever was just, you know, even if you've done everything, you're having quite a nice time, it's just knowing it's never going to stop. That's why I don't understand why people want to go to heaven, because it's like then it's just eternity. And you're yeah, not but then ha- maybe there's another bit after that. 
And then you yeah, get but then it keeps going. Like well, maybe you get to heaven. Yeah. They go, yeah, this isn't it. Yeah, I yeah. quite like that idea of the afterlife. You're not getting any answers because everyone thinks the afterlife uh, gives you lots of answers. But you're good to get there and go, yeah, no, we don't. We know don't what have a fucking We don't clue. know what's going on. <laughs> That's what it's like when you go to a BBC meeting, isn't it? <laughs> you get excited. They go, we don't fucking know. <laughs> You do. So you've got this book. We're going to talk about your book. Is this, yeah. is this uh, The Tales of the Weird, the Wild and the Wonderful? Oh, yeah. That, um, I wrote that. That was a children's book. Okay. I wrote that with a group of Kerr leavers last year. Cool. So we all... Um, that was part of the Stories of Kerr project. So we kind of wrote children's fiction. All the kids in the book, uh, other fictional characters, have had some Kerr experience themselves or not had normal uh, family backgrounds. And then they're available to buy online, and we give out thousands of copies to kids in Kerr now. So, yeah, that's that book. So that's it's still good. available on Amazon. Yeah, you can buy it for five ninety nine, or if you're a cheapskate, you can download it for free on your Kindle. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it, we're going to go from strength to strength. I'm very excited to see what you uh, are doing next. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming in. We give a massive round of applause, Sophie Willem. <laughs> Al Murray and Desiree Birch. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>